poster and on that poster was salat upon the Prophet ﷺ. And because of this, the people revolted against him, erupted in anger, a mob formed, and they killed him and burnt him. And they said this is justified because it is blasphemy. It is dishonoring the Prophet ﷺ. I have gotten a lot of emails and some of you asked me, is there something called blasphemy laws in Islam? And before I answer this question, I would like to state the question itself is actually not the right one to ask. You have jumped 10 steps ahead and you're asking, is there something called blasphemy laws? But the reality is that what happened is a tragedy regardless of what the books of fiqh and law say. Because no scholar and no madhab and no sensible person in Islamic history has ever allowed mobs to become judge, jury, and executioner. So the very fact that we jump to the question, what does fiqh say, indicates we have lost some steps in the middle. Regardless of what happens in a court of law, the mob does not become the court of law. So we have to understand this point that we have to look at ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, how is this happening? You know me, I don't mince my words. I ask you a blunt question. If a bunch of people of the Hindutva ideology had done this to a Muslim, if a bunch of Zionist settlers had done this to a Palestinian, what would your reaction be right now? How would be that anger and that rage legitimately? Then why is it among some people, not all, that when it happens in our lands, by our people, there is a deafening silence? Why the double standards? Mob mentality is never justified, ever, in any system, especially our system. And when one of ours makes a mistake, we should be the first to publicly say, we have nothing to do with this. It is reported in Sahih Bukhari that the Prophet ﷺ sent Khalid ibn Walid to an expedition and he made a mistake and he killed some people he shouldn't have killed. Sahih Bukhari, as soon as the Prophet ﷺ found out, he publicly stood up, he raised his hands, he said, Oh Allah, I dissociate in front of you from the actions of Khalid. I didn't tell him to do this. This is his, not on me. He publicly made a disclaimer. Islam has nothing to do with a mistake. It was a mistake. Inshallah, Allah forgave him. But you cannot just be quiet in the face of this mistake. Muslim communities cannot be quiet. And people are asking, and it is an incorrect question, what does Islam say about blasphemy? Regardless of what Islam says about blasphemy, that is not to be done by individuals, by mobs, by factory workers. And the very fact that this is so common, and the very fact that society is jumping to the 10th question, indicates we have bigger problems we have to worry about. But to quickly answer the question before moving on to the crux of the matter, what does Islam say about blasphemy? It is true that in an Islamic society, we will have red barriers that publicly cannot be done. Just like in this land, the purpose of law is civil order. And so when certain things happen that shouldn't happen, the law comes involved. So in an Islamic land, there's no question that we don't want open mockery of Allah and His Messenger. There's no question about that. And in our books of fiqh, there are regulations. Nobody can go in the public times square, town square, and shout things against Allah and His Messenger in an Islamic land. That's not civil society. So if that person does this, there are laws in place. In the time of our Prophet wasallam, multiple times he was mocked by his opponents. Sometimes he forgave, and sometimes they were in fact executed. This is the reality. But they all went to him. There was all something done by him. And multiple times, people who mocked him and made fun of him they asked for forgiveness and they were forgiven multiple times this happened so we have these instances in the seerah and from this our books of fiqh have derived laws and it is true that without a doubt that public disorder and public mockery of Allah and his messenger will not be allowed in an Islamic land but what is public mockery and what is blasphemy our books of fiqh are very clear Anything that is done that is blasphemous, it must be explicit, unambiguous and clear, and it must be intentional. Two conditions at a bare minimum. There cannot be ambiguity. It must be explicit. You cannot have two different opinions about it. And it must be intentional. So suppose somebody dropped a book, 
And then we found out it's the Quran. And he goes, oh, I didn't realize it's the Quran. It just slipped from my hands. If he says it's unintentional, we take his word for it. We find an excuse for the person. Intention and must be unambiguous. In this particular case, this person was a non-Muslim. He did not read Urdu from what I understand. And it's his factory. He's the owner of the factory. And the rule is don't post anything on the factory without permission. So he pulled it down and he didn't know. Or even if he did, even if he did, the niyyah was clearly not to make fun of the Prophet ﷺ. The niyyah was to enforce order. So regardless of which madhab you follow, it's a mistake to jump to the fiqh and ignore the realities. Even if it was explicit and unambiguous and intentional, you bring in the law and order, you bring in the judge, you bring in the, the, the government, and you do not take law into your own hands. Wallahi, we have a problem, brothers and sisters, when 400 people can gang up on one person and shout takbir and murder him viciously and take selfies and burn that corpse and they think they're doing something pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have a disease that needs to be spoken out against and that is the disease of fundamentalism, disease of over-exaggeration, disease of ignorance. If any other society did this against one of our own, what would we do? Yet when it happens amongst us, there is deafening silence. The irony of ironies, I was in Pakistan, by the way, 10 days ago, and I swear to you, as Allah is my witness, before the incident, because I was the government's go uh, guest, I met high-level scholars, I cannot mention their names. And in every one of those delegations, and I have witnesses that were with me, before this incident, this was the one issue I always brought up. Because I said to them, there was a very senior mufti, cannot mention his name, I said to him, Sheikh Saab, what happens in Pakistan affects us in America. What happens there becomes the front page of CNN and Fox News. It's not disconnected anymore. And I said to him, until our ulama, meaning our Pakistani ulama, stand up and teach the people they cannot do this. I said to him, what happens there will affect our communities here. The world is a globe. And I said with utmost respect, I am also one of you. These types of incidents are not common in other lands. They're primarily in this land. And I said, the irony of irony, Sheikh Saab, I said, Mufti Saab, you know you are Mufti, I said, in the Hanafi madhab, this is not even allowed. The one madhab that doesn't have blasphemy laws against Ahl al-Dhimma, against non-Muslims. The other three madhabs they do, by the way. The Hanafi madhab, which is actually very logical if you think about it, the Hanafi madhab says, a non-Muslim cannot be executed for blasphemy because he is already upon blasphemy. Think about it. Al-Kasani and others, the great Hanafi scholars, they say, what greater blasphemy is there than to consider the Prophet is not telling the truth when he says he's a prophet. You see what I'm saying here, right? What greater blasphemy is there? We're allowing them to live in non-Muslim in, in Muslim lands. So if he were to say something publicly, the max you can do is jail or in prison. You don't actually execute. I said to the Mufti Saab, Mufti Saab, in Pakistan, where most of us are Hanafi here. Yet in our madhab, there is leeway in this and yet still for some reason our land seems to be the most hardcore in this regard I said can you explain to me this conundrum this problem he smiled and he goes if I knew what to tell you I would tell you I don't know what to tell you right it's our people that are so jazbati so emotional and I said very bluntly with respect I said Sheikh Saab Mufti Saab if you don't collectively take a stand if you don't collectively start preaching Something else might happen. I swear to you, I said this when I was in the land to a senior mufti and now what happened, happened. Because we know this is the reality of that, 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 that part of the world that we are all from. And I said to another sheikh I was with that why is there so much silence? And he told me the reality. And because I'm in America, I can say this. He said this. We are all terrified of who? Of the mob. The mob because if you dare open this topic, you become Ghustakhi Rasul. You become the one that is somehow not honoring the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And what can you do when the leaders and scholars themselves are hesitant to speak? And I encourage them because they're land in the end of the day. I'm a visitor. I encourage them to take the leadership in this regard. And we have to ask ourselves a very blunt question. Where is this misunderstanding coming from. Even if they followed the Maliki position, the Hanbali position, the Shafi'i position, they would take this person to the court, the court would look in, the court would say, this was ambiguous and there was no intention, so he should be forgiven, no problem. 
especially if they're Hanafi. There is no question then of blasphemy laws. It doesn't apply to non-Muslims. The max you can do is, as we say, ta'zir. But the question arises, and this is the awkward one I wanted to talk about. Why does this mentality exist? And I will tell you why. Because it deals directly with me and many of us here. This mentality exists because we have allowed this type of speech and rhetoric to become mainstream. Our leaders and clerics are preaching hatred of other people for years and decades. And when you preach hatred and you keep on enforcing they're this and they're that and yilog esa and they're like this, those years and decades of hate, they become concentrated in the heart. It's literally like you're pouring gasoline for years on a society. Then when somebody else lights the match, you say, oh, I didn't do that, but you did. By teaching your people who are struggling to be good Muslims, struggling to pray five times a day, you are prioritizing hating other people. What's going to happen? And this is the reality of the BJP. It is the reality of Zionism. It is the reality of every far right in this country. What do they do? They keep on indoctrinating their people to hate another group of people. And my understanding of Islam, my understanding of the seerah, we concentrate on our faults more than the faults of other people. And it's related to me directly. I'm being honest with you. I'm, you are my community. As you are aware, alhamdulillah, many people appreciate what I do and other people are not so appreciative. And I have many who keep on releasing videos. The largest group of critics against me, he is too soft on the other groups. He doesn't speak the haqq against those groups. Do you know why I don't speak with those adjectives and nouns? This is exactly why. Because 20 years ago, I used to. When I was 20 years old, that's exactly how I would speak. But as you grow in wisdom, in maturity, in experience, you understand that words have repercussions. You understand that when you preach and teach in a violent and vulgar manner to a people who themselves just need to, yeah, you do not build your Islam by destroying the Islam of other people. Memorize this rule. You do not build your Iman by destroying the Iman of other groups. Even if the group is wrong, you correct the idea without preaching hatred. It is possible to talk about other ideas without bringing people in, without preaching hatred. The main goal of this religion is personal tazkiyah. Come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there are some people, they love to prioritize other people, other groups, conspiracy theories. They do this, they do that. And in the process, what happens? This deep-seated hatred and resentment comes. Such that the smallest ambiguous provocation, ambiguous, and all of a sudden, 400 people think, Nayara Takbir, and they kill somebody, and they burn him, and they take selfies, thinking that this is something pleasing to Allah. Wallahi, we have to ask ourselves, where is this coming from? And the answer I told you, no matter how politically incorrect, somebody has to say it. Because if we don't say it, and we don't preach against it, what's going to happen? We need to stop these preachers of hate. Some of them are going around saying, Man sabba nabiyan faqturu. This hadith, aslan, it is not even authentic. There is no such hadith in the books of hadith. It is mentioned in a tertiary book, al kamil fi Du'afa al-Rijal, which is not even an authentic. The book is about da'if hadith. And this preacher, may Allah forgive him, I have nothing against the person, I never met him. He preaches to millions of people something that is not even authentic, and nobody corrects him. Whoever curses the Prophet should be killed. Even if the principle is in the Shafi'i school, it's not a hadith. The judge is the one after all of these entire trial. And by the way, even the Shafi'i and other schools, they say, if the person says he's sorry, he repents, you give him the opportunity to repent. Tawbah is there. Who are you to come between a person and tawbah, even if it was intentional and ambiguous? And he says, you know what? I made a mistake. I ask Allah's forgiveness. I won't do it again. Some of them have said, even then, forgive him. But for us to do this mob mentality, without any sense of justice. And the final point, and I've already dug myself deep enough, so Allah musta'an, but it has to be said, brothers and sisters. I am a minor student of knowledge in the grand scale of things. I don't consider myself to be a top tier Shaykh al-Islam. A'udhu billah. I'm a tawaylib, as I say, minor student of knowledge. But I have spoken not to a few, dozens, maybe even a hundred ulama around the world asking the same question. Ulama double my age, maybe even triple a few years ago my age. Senior ulama. I have spoken to Shaykh Qardawi and others directly, many senior ulama about this one issue. And I say this just so that you understand this isn't coming from me. 
I have asked many ulama this question in the modern world that we live in. Is there room for renegotiating the laws of Islam as they apply to the nation state? Can we rethink through what can and cannot be done for the time being? Not a permanent ban, not, but rethink through the punishments and the ridda laws and the hudud laws. And every single person that I have asked, because I asked those that I consider to be ulama, forward-thinking, open-minded, everyone that I have asked has said the exact same thing, which is that, yes, this goes back to pros and cons, masalih and mafasid. And they give me examples from the seerah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by Umar ibn Khattab, why don't you execute Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul? He's a leader of the munafiqun. He's nothing but trouble. Execute him. We know who he is. The Quran has been revealed about him. Execute him. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? No, I don't want people to misunderstand and say, I'm killing my own companions. He took the PR into account. He understood that there are repercussions globally by doing something that might look good domestically. When he conquered Mecca, he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, I wish I could demolish the Kaaba and reconstruct it on the original structure of Ibrahim. But the Quraysh are new Muslims. They wouldn't understand. They would reject this. They would think I'm destroying the Kaaba. I don't want to do that. So he left it upon that. He understood there's something that you look at the pros and cons in the global world that we live in. When there are large Muslim minorities like us in America and Australia and Canada and something happening in Pakistan has global impact, can we rethink through in the nation state certain laws? Every alim says yes, because temporarily you can rethink. By the way, the science of applying Islam at a societal level, it is a separate branch of fiqh. It is called siyasa shari'ya. It is called Islamic political science. The fact of the matter, most minor students of knowledge, they study a book of fiqh and they think this book is the constitution of the country. No, books of fiqh are personal between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't change those just because of a culture and society. Applying fiqh at a communal level, at a societal level, that is a separate branch of Islam. And unfortunately, many people don't study that branch. The top scholars do. That's why they all understand. Sometimes you can temporarily fine-tune. We're not saying abrogate. Nobody has the right to abrogate the sharia. Ah. So this notion of blasphemy and of riddah, we have the right in every society, Muslim majority, to say what can and cannot be done. And that is not a rejection of the sharia. Ah. Sadly, what happens when I say this? You have the ultra zealots. A'udhu billah. He's a sellout. He's a liberal. He's appeasing the kuffar. A'udhu billah. No. This is fiqh. As Sufyan al said, Anybody can take the most difficult opinion and apply it. Fiqh is to know when to apply the concession. This is what Sufyan al said. Anybody can find the most difficult and say this is Islam. No, real Islam, which is real fiqh, when can we make the concession? So to conclude, I know it's an emotional topic, but wallahi, somebody has to say so that we feel that this is our religion. And if you disagree with me, come and speak with me directly and let's go back and forth. I conclude a number of points. First and foremost, it is a mistake of the highest magnitude to worry about fiqh when what happened is absolutely haram, regardless of which madhab you follow. You do not not allow vigilante justice and mob mentality. Secondly, even according to those madhabs, it will be a court of law and there are many conditions. Most importantly, it is clear cut that the person intends to disrespect Allah and His Messenger and says something that is absolutely unambiguously clear. Our scholars say, Qurtub and others, they mention, if the man says, a Christian says, God has a son, this might be blasphemous to us, but it is not blasphemy that will get him killed. That's his aqidah. That's his aqidah. If God has a son, then what do you expect the Christian to say? That's his belief. So what is he saying? What is the intention needs to be looked at? The court of law does that. Is he asking for forgiveness? Point number three, in the Hanafi school, it's not even applicable for upon non-Muslims in the first place. Point number four, we have to ask ourselves, where is this hatred coming from? And the fact of the matter, we do have preachers and clerics who are fomenting this. Why? Because it makes people popular. Let's be honest here. People like me are not popular in many circles because I'm saying we don't do this. We unite together. We don't preach hatred. As much as we can, we bring our societies together. If you need to correct, correct with wisdom. Correct ideas without preaching hatred. This is what I'm saying to people. But unfortunately, not everybody's like this. And then the last point, and it needs to be said, top-notch ulama,
ulama, the, the, the cream of the crop, they're allowed to come together in every land and rethink through what can be applied at a national level. That's separate than what is found in the books of fiqh. Sometimes you can lift for a while and sometimes you can apply for a while. In the end, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for hidayah and tawfiq. We ask Allah to grant us wisdom and knowledge of this deen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that our societies become role model societies for people around the globe. Jazakumullah.